Hey there, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, so in this, our latest uh, edition on our series on uh, introductory econometrics, we're going to be talking about the problem of multicollinearity. Now, multicollinearity is a very common problem, right? In fact, it, nearly always you're going to have some degree of multicollinearity. So it's something that we need to be aware of. We need to understand and you know, we need to understand uh, to the extent that we can how to identify it and remedy it. Multicollinearity occurs when one of our, two or more of our independent variables can be expressed in some way, or shape, or form as a function of each other. Okay. Now, within that, we have the idea of perfect or imperfect multicollinearity. Perfect multicollinearity occurs when two or more of our independent variables are perfect linear functions of each other. Okay. And in fact, in this case, if we have this problem, our regression, if we're using some computer software, right, our regression won't run. We'll get an error message. And if we're attempting to do it by hand, you, you won't be able to solve it. <laughs> okay. In uh, perfect multicollinearity, as it as occurs when, when two or more of our independent variables are perfect linear functions of each other, but what does that mean in normal people speak? Well, if we were to try to run a regression where we had one of our independent variables being, like, say, distance in feet, and then another one of our independent variables being distance in yards to the same thing. Well, those two variables are perfect linear functions of each other. Distance in yards is simply going to be one third distance in feet always, right? So if we took our the, any given observation of our independent variable in feet, right, and we put a three in front of it, or excuse me, a one third in front of it, we would get our that observation for distance in yards, right? Now, as I say, if when we cases when we have this perfect multicollinearity, our regression won't run. Basically, it won't work. And why is that? Well, it's important to understand uh, on a fairly deep level what's going on here because it's really the key to understanding everything in, in well, well, not everything, but everything in this lecture, right? Okay. If you recall from our second video on uh, in this series where we actually uh, showed mathematically how we estimate the, uh, the coefficients on our independent variables. Uh, when we do that, we are holding all other variables. So let's say we're estimating the coefficient on our first x variables, like x1, right? What we're doing when we do that is we're holding all other independent variables constant. Okay. Uh, it, and of course, that, that's central to what we're doing, right? So we're trying to look at the variations in, in a given independent variable without including any of the variations from other independent variables, because the whole point is to try to figure out what's the impact of this specific variable on our dependent variable. Okay, We simply can't do that when two or more of our variables are linear functions of each other. Why? OK. Well. <clears throat> Let's think of a case where we're, you know, we've been tasked with watching a bunch of kids, right? I, normally, I don't do these sort of stupid stories in these videos because I try to keep them really short, right? But this, this is what you would get if you took a class, right? This is what you're not getting in these videos. You're not getting, because in class, I would have all kinds of these stories, right? But this one, I think, is really central. Let's say that you've been tasked with watching a bunch of kids. You know, they're playing uh, on the playground or whatever or, you know, just in the neighborhood or something like this. And you've got these two kids, two kids who always do the same thing. Like, you know, you, you say hi to them, they both answer hi, right, with their right hand, and they both wave twice, right? They're the same. They do everything the same as each other. And then, you know, you turn your back for a few minutes, and a stick comes flying, and you turn back around quickly, you see these two kids there, okay? How are you going to tell which one threw it? They do everything exactly the same as each other. There's no way to separate out the actions of one from the actions of the other. And as a consequence, you cannot predict the actions of one or the other. You can only predict their actions as a set, right? They are inseparable in terms of their actions and outcomes. And this is what's going on with multicollinearity in your model. Well, perfect multicollinearity. Okay. So in this case, it just doesn't work. Now, that's pretty uncommon, right? More often, you'd be like, well, kid, they're not exactly the same. Right? OK, that's right. That's imperfect multicollinearity, right? So 
in this case, the two independent variables may, may be correlated with each other, but not in a linear fashion. Okay, to understand each of these sort of more mathematically, again, keeping in mind that there's for each of these there's always a companion video. This is the theoretical one with this sort of sciencey background, right? And then the, there's the chalkboard one where we background where we <clears throat> we we sort of actually do the, the applied version of this, right? Okay, so the first example here is is perfect multicollinearity, right? So if we if we have one variable x, like I mentioned a moment ago, like say distance in, in let's say meters this time to be metric system. Uh, and then we also have, you know, distance in kilometers. Well, then that value alpha just takes on the parameter a thousand or one over a thousand, depending on which way you're, you're going, right? There, one kilometer is always a thousand meters. So two kilometers is 2000 meters and three kilometers is 3000 meters. Those are going to those two variables are going to exhibit perfect multicollinearity, and simply that you you can't you can't solve that you can't estimate that uh, regression equation. The second one here, you know, I x one, you know, maybe let's say it's a person's income in period t, and x two is t plus one is a person's wealth in period t plus one. Now those two variables are almost certainly going to be correlated. So if a person's income goes up. You know, it's highly likely that their income is going to go up, or excuse me, their wealth is going to go up in the next period. Are they likely to be perfectly multicollinear? No, no. There's almost certain to be other disturbances in a person's wealth. So, for example, let's say, you know, their income went up this year, but they also had some big medical bills. Well, then their wealth is likely to go down in the next period, right? So they're going to track together but not always. So as, to reiterate over here now, right, so the, the thing, you know, the thing with perfect multicollinearity is, is this, right? And you know, the thing with imperfect multicollinearity is that it's more difficult to separate out or our certainty of the impacts of one variable versus the other becomes reduced, right? Probably it was due, so imperfect multicollinearity, probably it was that kid could have been that kid too. Okay, so our ability to separate out takes a bit of a hit. So before we move on from this, we want to talk for a second about dominant variables. And dominant variables occur when we have one of our independent variables is highly, highly correlated with our dependent variable. So the example over here is like sort of EC104 consumption function. Uh, the, you know, the dominant determinant of people's current consumption is going to be their current income, and uh, that's what we're showing here, right? <clears throat> and if we were to introduce additional variables into that equation, uh, it, it's highly likely that unless we were to take precautions against it, that uh, our income variable is going to dominate all other explanatory variables uh, and is going to impact our estimated regression results. Again. Okay, so let's then move on to imperfect multicollinearity, which is what, what we're going to see uh, in, in, in our work uh, you know, unless, unless we made a direct error. <laughs> okay, so in this case, you know, we can sort of express this idea like this over here. So here we have uh, x1 and x2, right? And there's a clear relationship between x1 and x2, but there's also a degree of randomness. Uh, and, and this is sort of like we're getting at a moment ago with wealth and income, you know, so let's say that that uh, you know, people's people's wealth x1 can be explained by their historic income x2, uh, but there's also other stuff that happens, right? You know, like I mentioned big medical bills or, or 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 you know maybe irregular large expenditures or something like that 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 cause their wealth to go down even in periods when income goes up. Okay, this is going to be imperfectly multicollinear, right? There's going to be a lot of examples where people's income goes up in one period and then the next period their wealth goes up, but not always, not always. There's going to be a randomness to that. So, you know, you can kind of start to get a feel for what's going on here, I think, by now with this problem of multicollinearity. So what is occurring, you know, mathematically, what's occurring in our estimated regression equation when we have some degree of multicollinearity? Well, our estimated betas, or the estimated values of our coefficients, um, are unbiased, right? Remain unbiased, right? So, so the presence of multicollinearity alone does not bias our estimators, right? So you imagine, imagine that thing like where we're trying to prick which kid through the stick, right? <laughs> Just keep that in mind, right? 
So <clears throat> your estimators remain unbiased, but what happens is you become unsure about each one of them a little bit more, right? So so it could have been that kid, but maybe that kid, because sometimes they do stuff the same, right? And that shows up in our reg estimated regression output in terms of the variances and standard errors associated with each of those betas. In other words, we become less sure that any one of our uh, independent variables is uh, of how the nature of those independent variables is in determining variations in our dependent variable. Um, consequently, of course, the computed t-scores will fall because they're, of course, come from the above. And also the other thing we're going to notice practically is that our estimates are going to become more sensitive to changes in specification. So in the last video we saw, you know, like if we have an omitted variable or um, just really poor choice of variables in our model, what we're going to notice is that our estimated betas bounce around a lot. So we change the model up a little bit and they, you know, they bounce around a lot. And we're going to notice that here too, right? So if we have a degree of multicollinearity, we're going to notice that small changes in specifications uh, to our model uh, have relatively big impacts on our estimated coefficients. <clears throat> Detecting this, right? So now that we understand sort of what both imperfect and perfect multicollinearity are, right? How do we how do we figure out if we have it? <laughs> well, first of all, you know, you kind of have to be aware that that almost always you're going to have some some multicollinearity, right? It's just going to be there. Okay, um, you know, if we think about any sort of you know, real sort of situation that we, we would be modeling here. Uh, like, let's say we're, we're, we're trying to figure out, you know, like, like what, what a house is worth, right? So we're trying to look at housing price. Uh, what, what variables explain housing prices? Well, you know, it's, it's highly likely that as the size of a house increases, the number of bedrooms is going to increase. Maybe bathrooms too, right? So bigger houses have more bathrooms. That's that's imperfect multicollinearity, right? Is it always going to be the case? No. But is it generally going to be the case? Yes. Okay. Now, does that mean that we should eliminate <laughs> uh, the number of bedrooms as an explanatory variable in determining home prices? No. Does not mean that at all, right? Uh, but it does mean that we need to understand that that there's likely some multicollinearity between the two. Okay. So third, you know, there's there's no way to conclusively detect multicollinearity, right? I'm going to show you in a moment some things, you know, sort of what we do, uh, and they're they're good, they're good, good things to do, right? Um, but but not conclusive. And the the most common thing that we do in in regression analysis to detect multicollinearity, right? And 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 it's not that hard to do, and and you should sort of, if you can, make it make a general practice, uh, and that's to construct and examine a correlation matrix. Now, okay, now over here we see an example of, a, of independent variables here, miles per gallon, number of cylinders in a car engine, displacement of a car engine, horsepower, that's the amount of uh, uh, um, energy that the, sorry, not energy, it's, about the, it's the amount of work that the engine can do, the weight of the car, and then how fast the car accelerates. Okay, and looking here, first thing you notice is down the diagonal, these are all ones. Why? Because miles per gallon is perfectly correlated with miles per gallon. Cylinders is perfectly correlated with cylinders. Okay, so you get an idea how to read this from that. When we look at the number of cylinders in miles per gallon, we see a negative correlation, meaning that as the number of cylinders in the engine goes up, the miles per gallon tend to go down. Not always, 0.78, right? Sometimes it goes in the other direction, but most of the time it goes in the opposite direction. Displacement, or how big is the engine and the miles per gallon. A little stronger correlation as the engine gets bigger, miles per gallon goes down, un unsurprisingly. Okay, Horsepower, miles per gallon. As horsepower goes up, miles per gallon goes up. So you can see that most of these are pretty strongly correlated. Not so much acceleration in miles per gallon, but almost all the others. Some of them like horsepower and displacement. Bigger engines produce more power, yeah. Okay. Um, so these are pretty highly correlated, and, and it's likely if we were to, you know, this this is likely problematic, right? But one other thing we want to know, so you might be thinking, like, well, does that mean that the whole, you know, that this is all sort of redundant? Yes, you could design that this core, everything above here, right, is, is essentially redundant, or below here, right? So uh, everything here is mirrored here, 0 0.9, 0 0.9, 0 0.09, 0 0.9, 0 0.9, so on and so forth, okay?
So, you know, here, degrees of correlation between the variable. We, what we want to be doing as a practical matter when we construct this correlation matrix is kind of looking and seeing what we have here. If you have this much correlation, you probably want to start rethinking about your model and kind of brainstorming about how you can sort of fix this a little bit. And I'll give you some ideas about that in just a second. Okay. Uh, in most cases, hopefully, we don't have this serious of an issue. The second way in which we can check for multicollinearity in our model uh, is to use this variance inflation factor uh, over here. Okay, and what we're doing when we when we when we why we do this uh, or how we do this is let's say we have this hypothesized relationship here. Okay, so we're saying that this dependent variable we believe is a uh, explained by these this series of independent variables. What we can do is we can run this regression here. So we can take our x1 as a dependent variable and regress it against all of our others, x2 and x3. And what we're doing, you know, intuitively what we're doing when we're, when we're running that is we're saying, okay, well how much of the variation in this independent variable can be explained by our other independent variables? Okay. And of course if we can explain a lot of this movement here with these, for sure, they're correlated, right? They're correlated. So, you know, we're detecting multicollinearity. That specific VIF, you know, variation inflation factor is given by this. So VIF of beta one, so in this case, how uh, much multicollinearity is exhibited in this estimated coefficient, beta one, can be given by one over the R squared associated with this here, right? So R squared being what, what we've always, what it always is, so it's goodness of fit. And so, of course, then, uh, as, as that goes up, as we're able to explain more and more of this movement here by movements over here, right, the, the more likely it is that we have significant multicollinearities. Okay. Now, as a final note, you know, if you've, if you've, he you've heard people talking about tolerance tests and things like that, right, um, essentially the same idea, right, essentially the same idea. Okay, so let's say you know we've run these correlation matrix, or we you know we've done the the VIFs, right? And what, what do we do? <laughs> okay, well, <clears throat> you know if if you if you feel confident about the model, you think like, wow, this is, this is the right model, right? Then you know it you probably you know you don't maybe don't want to do anything, you know. So let let's go back to that home example I talked about a little earlier. Let's say we you know we're trying to explain home prices and we put you know bedrooms and bathrooms and square footage in the model and a bunch of other things and we run that correlation matrix and we find that 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 bedrooms number of bedrooms and the square footage of the house are highly correlated well should we pull one of those variables out no no you shouldn't pull one of those variables out because they're both important to explaining home prices um, the fact that we can't predict the individual effects perfectly, right, is not a good enough reason to pull to pull one of those variables out. And if we did pull one of those variables out, we would almost certainly be doing more harm to our overall model than good. Uh, we may improve the R squared, uh, but that's that's an inferior model when when compared to the the first one. Okay. Now, in some cases, if we believe that we have two variables that that were one where there's a redundancy, right? So the two variables, like in the case of like distance in meters and distance in kilometers, one of those is totally redundant, right? They're telling us the same information. And if, if we drop one in that case, then, then we're going to improve the results, right? So we're going to, first of all, we don't, in that case, we're going to allow the, the regression will actually run and be solvable, uh, but, uh, but, or estimatable, I should say, um, uh, and we're going to improve results. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, that's a possibility. That's a possibility. But but more often, you know, it makes sense to do do nothing again when the model is well specified. The best thing you can do, right? The best thing you can do is to increase the size of your sample. Okay, now to understand why that is, let's go way back to the beginning with the kids with the sticks examples. Okay. So let's say you know you watch those kids for a day and they always do the same thing. You watch them for three days and boy, they still always do the same thing. But you watch them for a year and you start to find little things that they do differently. And those little differences in what they do differently is how you're able to start detecting impacts 
from that kid versus that kid. Okay, so the greater your sample size, the greater, the more likely that those divergences increase and your collinearity decreases. Okay, so single best solution. All right, well, that's it for this time. Um, it's been really short talking about blood clarity. I feel like I should have talked about it a lot more, but uh, it's probably long enough. So uh, thanks, everybody. Hope you're having fun. I, I, we're a little better than halfway through the series, and, and I'll, I'll admit I'm having fun. Okay, take care. Everybody.